It's about the structural and cultural barriers that prevent doc makers from underrepresented communities from accessing funding and some of the institutions and people who are working to reduce those barriers. Jesse Wenty is an Ojibwe writer, broadcaster, producer, and speaker. Born and raised in Toronto, his family hails from Chicago and the Serpent River First Nation. He's been a culture critic on CBC Radio's Metro Morning for over 20 years. In 2018, Jesse became the first director of the Indigenous Screen Office. He is currently co-producing a screen adaptation of Thomas King's best-selling book, The Inconvenient Indian, and he is also working on his first book for Penguin Random House Canada. Heidi Tao Yang oversees the Hot Docs Film Funds, a portfolio which provides grants and equity funding for docs. In this role, she works with filmmakers from around the world on their projects and manages Hot Docs investment in filmmakers' work and professional development. Claire Aguilar will moderate this conversation. She is the Director of Programming and Policy at the International Documentary Association, IDA, where she oversees education and training initiatives and sets strategy and policy uh, and advocacy work. She serves as a primary programmer for IDA's biennial doc conference. It's called Getting Real. The next one will take place in September 2020. If you haven't been, I highly recommend it. Join me in welcoming Jesse, Heidi, and Claire to the stage. Hi everyone, it's so nice to see you. Thanks for coming out to our panel about underrepresented makers and funding and support. Um, my name's Claire Aguilar from IGA. And, um, and with me today, as, as Danae mentioned, is Heidi Tao Yang and from, the, from Hot Docs, local girl, and Jesse Wente from the Indigenous Screen Office joining me on this panel. Um, So we have, a, we have a kind of a juicy area to talk about, and that's about underrepresented um, makers and how are they able to get support. Um, and one of the questions that I first had when we started this panel was the whole definition of what underrepresented means in our communities. Um, how I've worked in um, media for many years and always wanted to, um, to um, support underrepresented filmmakers as well as audiences and doing so in public media but also as a funder and um, one of the things that we looked at when I was a funder for ITVS which is a um, it's a it's a nonprofit that distributes money to um, mostly documentary makers which is mandated by Congress out of a miracle of public policy it still exists and ITVS was able, at, at the time it was founded in 1991, to give over $7 million to um, production for independent filmmaking. And one of the mandates, which was defined by the US Congress, was to make programming accessible for, in their words, minorities and children. So those were the privileged areas in which we had to um, channel our funds. Um, for minorities, it was kind of a no-brainer because it was a great way to access the incredible talent from people of color in those producing pools. For children, it was more of a challenge because we weren't really funding children's programming nor teen programming. We weren't really doing Sesame Street. So um, on the other hand, um, it was something that kind of set the bar for that kind of underrepresented audience. For us, it meant a lens of culture and color. But then it came to expand in many other ways. So since then, since the 90s, there have been other initiatives. And I'm really happy to be here in Canada, where there's been quite a lot of movement in um, funding for people who are underrepresented in, in media, especially in documentary. And we have two people here who could talk about what they're doing. Um, before we start, I just want to mention a little bit of what we're doing at IDA, and that's that we don't have a, a sort of a diversity or inclusion initiative per se, but it's incorporated in what we do. Um, we have some funding initiatives. One is called the Enterprise um, Documentary Fund, which is for journalistic uh, films. 
and that um, there's a development and also a production grant available. And there's a, there's a very big priority to fund underrepresented makers in that pool. It's going to open again in 2020. So I encourage you to look at our website, documentary.org, if you want to hear about that. So there is a development stage as well as a production stage that we're funding. We also have a grant we call Elevate that's given to two, um, two female uh, women of color producers, and that will be determined for um, 2020 as well. So um, we're very happy to fund um, six producers in the past, and um, the last was uh, Violet Fung, and um, also the filmmaker Jackie Olive for this Elevate grant. And you can read that, about that on our, um, on our page as well. But let's get into what people, are, what people are doing, especially what Heidi and Jesse are doing. So do you want to start, sure. Heidi, to talk sure. about what's happening at Hot Docs? Sure. There's lots of stuff going on at Hot Docs. Um, who here has been to Hot Docs? Oh, great, all of you, so you know what we're all about, and you know that we fund projects, right? Um, so we have a $10 million fund. We fund many different types of projects, you know, Canadian projects, co-production projects, um, and we have um, the Hot Docs Blue Ice Group Fund, which is a fund for filmmakers um, who live and work on the continent of Africa, and we also, not only do we give funds, but there is a robust professional development aspect to it that is year-round. And we also have the Cross Currents Documentary Fund, um, which is, you know, we have an international stream which is open to um, global storytellers from all over the world, and we look for projects um, from filmmakers telling stories directly from their underrepresented community, historically underrepresented, and we have a Canadian stream where we um, have priority groups. We're looking for projects from Indigenous filmmakers, Francophone filmmakers, filmmakers uh, deaf with disability, and uh, those who identify as people of color. Um, and those stories can be about anything at all. And um, something really exciting that uh, started last year is um, we took our existing programs that we already have and um, we put them under this umbrella called Canadian Storytellers Project. And this is something where, you know, we have workshops all over Canada called Doc Ignite, where we go to filmmakers from across Canada um, that can't necessarily come to us, so we go to them and we do these workshops on pitching and fundraising and budgeting and all sorts of things um, to help filmmakers uh, make their, help them make their project. Um, we have a Doc Accelerator Lab, which is um, a, a lab during Hot Docs um, for uh, the priority groups I just mentioned, as well as the um, Canada, Cross Currents Canada Fund as well. Just a little bit of what we do. <laughs> Hot Docs is also engaged. You do a lot of research, don't you? I know that we, it, at, our, at our conference getting real, um, Elizabeth Ratchow was there and, and she, she revealed um, a lot of research of what is happening in the festival and, and market and how does that inform your initiatives? Um, yeah, we, we do, um, this is the second time we've done the documentary audiences research where we look at what people are watching, how they're watching, uh, because part of accessibility is you make your film, but you know, you don't want just your mom and dad to watch it. You want to know who your audience is, is and where to find them. Maybe they're online, but maybe they're just going to screenings, but you have to know those things, and that's some of what our um, research revealed is just where those people are. And what we have discovered is, yeah, they are watching it online. They're watching online. They're watching it online, yeah. yeah. I and think it's something like this is well over, I don't know the exact figure, but I'm positive it's over like 75%. I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the focus on diversity from the, the kind of the diverse initiatives that you have as well, everything from Blue Eyes to Cross Currents, I mean, there seems to be also this um, look for, for younger, um, younger makers and younger um, producers. 
Does we, that work across the board? Um, we, um, for our Hot Docs Blue Ice Group Fund for, um, for African filmmakers, we ask that um, they have um, one professional credit. But we really assess, you know, the whole package of um, what that looks like, and it doesn't mean that they have to be young necessarily. For our Cross Currents Fund, we're looking for emerging filmmakers. Mm. So, if you, you know, doesn't matter how old you are, you can be young or middle age or you know whatever age you are. If you are an emerging filmmaker or you made three films or less, you know, we want to hear from you. That's great. Thank you. Um, Jesse, at the Indigenous Screen Office, you've really done a lot of, you've made a lot of headway. Can you talk about what your new initiatives are or what you're working on? Sure. Um, so first of all, I'd say the Indigenous Screen Office started just about 18 months ago. So we are a relatively <clears throat> new, not relatively, we are a new organization. <clears throat> um, so we're not, we don't quite have the funding capacity yet um, to actually be contributing to the production of a whole lot of content yet. Um, we do have a couple of initiatives through a partnership with Netflix that funds uh, mid-career professional development mentorship opportunities on set, as well as a separate stream that really funds the protocol or right relations work really in early stage development. So before you start telling an indigenous story to make sure you actually have all the permissions and gained access to the community appropriately and have all of that um, squared away. Of course, we're one of the, the people that helped publish the Protocols and Pathways um, document that came out. Um, so we wanted to make sure we had a fund to actually support the implementation, the real world application of those protocols and the telling of, in, of indigenous uh, stories. Um, and that's really, we're not quite there yet, you know. Uh, on this stage, in about a year, this might be a very different conversation, um, but we're, we need, I need that another year. Can you, um, just for my own ignorance as an American, talk about the, um, just the, the indigenous community in Canada and what that comprises, and does your, does the indigenous screen office have any connectivity or, you know, collaboration with Native American groups? Um, so I'll take the second question first because the first question is a daunting answer. <laughs> um, uh, sure. Uh, um, I mean, our mandate is really on uh, this side of the colonial border because we are largely publicly financed. So when you're uh, getting, receiving public funds or dispersing public funds, you, they tend to want you to spend those in the area that the colonial government um, dictates. We are working on that because, um, of course, the border is not our border. And so I'm not sure it makes sense for indigenous artists to have to follow the rules of that border since it isn't our border. And likewise, you know, I would include not just our border with the U.S., but our border in the north with other countries mm. uh, in the north where the nations are actually the exact same nations, just separate islands. Um, uh, so we, we do, but again, I think those, those partnerships are, are still to come. Obviously, we have a deal with Netflix, but that was made through the Canadian side of, of uh, Netflix. In terms of the indigenous community in Canada, well, 60 different language groups, over 600 different communities, but those are the colonial divisions of the communities. Um, 4.9% uh, of the population, uh, and I would say uh, the history of in indigenous media in Canada um, is relatively new compared to the, the large scope of it. Um, although the media t extracting stories from our communities, of course, is very much like in America, not new at all. It's sort of one of the main purposes of media here in the first place. Mm -hmm. Can you go into a little more detail about the protocol document? Because this is a real, um, this is a real shape shifter in terms of what I understand, in terms of how you practice media, and also, you know, or, what there 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 was an existing protocol from Screen Australia. I understand, right. so that was one of the first. But just 
what it exactly, I've been able to look at it online. It's really impressive. In fact, you, everyone should take a look at it in terms of how do you practice in these communities and what kinds of things you should follow and guidelines. But can you talk a little bit more in depth about it? Sure, yeah. so the protocols document was the result of more than a year of consultations with indigenous communities, indigenous uh, creators. It is very much inspired by the similar document in Australia, which has been around for uh, I think almost 15 years at this point, more than 10. Uh, likewise, Australia has had an indigenous screen office uh, for 25 yeah. years and we're just 18 months old. So you can see a bit of a, a disparity there. Um, and the document really is a way, uh, is really a guide or a, a pathways for producers and not, it's really not for non-Indigenous producers, it's for Indigenous producers as well, to make sure we understand the right way to go into community, the reciprocal nature uh, of that relationship, how you should leave more than you take out of, of a community, um, how you should be considering uh, whether you are even the right person to tell an Indigenous story if you're not Indigenous. If, you know, before you even go to any pitch session anywhere, it, are you the right person to tell that story? Is there an Indigenous person who might be better positioned to tell that uh, story? Um, and it also provides some information for the communities themselves. It was always meant to be a document that works for both sides because for many communities, some will actually have cultural protocol offices already in the community, many won't. And for them, they may not be familiar with the ways of the movie business, and this provides them some information of what to ask producers or storytellers who want to come into their communities so they can make informed choices as well as whether to grant access um, to their communities and to their, their stories. You know, there's different protocols depending on different nations. So the document is really meant to be adaptable to whichever nation you're in so that they can make it work for them. So for instance, for, for some nations, storytelling is hereditary. So to access a traditional story, you actually have to ask the specific family if they are willing to gift you that story. <clears throat> um, in other nations, it will work differently. So it's really uh, a malleable document and it's meant to reset the way indigenous storytelling goes about in the screen sector very broadly in that I'm, it has been an inequitable relationship as really this whole project has been an inequitable relationship between the nations that have been here for millennia and the relatively new nations, not relatively, the very baby nations that are here now, um, about how we actually share stories equitably and in a way that allows our community to engage in the industrial uh, side and the storytelling side of actually sharing those those stories because we are in an industry but there aren't a lot of indigenous people employed in an industry that wants to tell their stories and that also needs to shift that brings up a, a i mean the the reality of the industry which is something that we recognize and and it's something that i've seen change a lot i remember when documentary was it wasn't a dirty word, but let's say it was the orphan child. You know, it wasn't the main child. And um, one of the reasons why IDA was formed um, over 35 years ago, actually, by a group of men who wanted to have the same, a group of white men, actually, <laughs> who wanted to have the same kind of standing for documentary that fiction had because they felt that it was like an only child. So they wanted to... Um, elevate the status of documentary so that it was worthy to um, have the same kind of awards that fiction films could have for the Oscars mainly. And it has succeeded in that. And it also has become a viable part of the industry. Um, but it also didn't include a lot of other producer representation in different communities. So that's something that we have to work toward in the industry part, right? So... Um, it's, it's interesting, because from my community side, I'd say the reverse, which is documentary was, was where we were allowed mm. entry. 
was where we were allowed to make films in the, say, 40 or 50 years ago. And actually, all of Indigenous cinema really globally started as a documentary tradition. And it wasn't, it's only relatively recently that we've gotten, we've been able to access fe the funds to make feature films. So documentaries, we still in Canada, I would say, produce more Indigenous documentaries than we do anything else. We still have way more Indigenous story t uh, documentary storytellers in Canada than we do on the fiction side. And I think that's very much because that's where our, our roots are. And to, the, to this day, that is where the larger funding exists for us to, to tell our stories, is actually on the documentary side. Organizations in Canada, like the National Film Board, uh, the CBC to some extent, have actually moved faster than their non, their fictional cohort, narrative cohorts, colleagues, to actually address these inequities. You know, where the NFB now spends, I think it's 15% of their annual budget making indigenous projects. Mm. Well, like Telefilm, it's 4.5%, right? Uh, uh, CBC, who can even tell? Um, so, <laughs> read their books, uh, you, you can't. <laughs> Um, so, I think that's meant that it's uh, interesting. Yeah. we have a little bit, for us, the documentary is still a, almost forefront in, our, in the creator's mind. That's your main, yeah, your yeah, mainstay. Our main output, yeah. But with the strong storytelling tradition, especially, I mean, with myth and fiction, and it just seems like that's something that has to change. It is slowly, and um, we'll get there. I, you know, there's a bunch of productions going now, the uh, non-documentary productions that we'll see, but at the same time, they will never outnumber the amount of documentaries, indigenous documentaries made in Canada. I can't see it uh, anytime soon. Now well, there's, a, there's an additional fund that they can apply to, the Cross Currents Canada Doc Fund. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go, yeah. I mean, some of the, I, I was gonna say that, um, some of the um, some of the great um, documentaries in um, like in American filmmaking are um, there's been a there's been certain trends and I think a lot of it has to do with the market but um, I think instead of getting into that, I, I wanted to make a, a, a kind of a connection between the market the rise of the market in documentaries but also the rise of um, the um, the gatekeeping kind of structures that uh, that control that market, and especially now with the proliferation of the platforms, and even though there are lots of great collaborative opportunities, your partnerships with Netflix, and there will be, and we can see it, especially next year, the proliferation of very powerful markets that are going to compete with Netflix, mm. like Amazon and Disney Plus, and. Um, especially working in what we'll call a uh, creative documentary, you know, which is not, it's not reality television. It aren't, it isn't, you know, Cake Boss or, you know, your, um, your how-tos. It's really this kind of documentary that we work in. So there's a buzz. I hope, <laughs> yeah, thank goodness other people hear that. <laughs> I'm worried. Um, what do you, do you have thoughts about those kind of gatekeeping structures or how is it, I mean, you, you both are in a positions of um, power, for want of a better word, to be able to um, engage the community and be able to, to green light projects, let's say. How do you see that changing? How is it important for your communities, especially underrepresented communities, to have people like you in these positions? Or how is, what is the process of getting more people into these decision-making and gatekeeping uh, positions? Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, I think central to the uh, Indigenous Screen Office's mission is something uh, that I describe as narrative sovereignty for Indigenous people, meaning the sovereignty over our own stories throughout the spaces that are, you are required to enter to tell those stories in a place like a documentary. So that would include all the institutions, the funders. And by that I mean indigenous people should really be the ones that decide what stories got to get told, by whom, how, who gets to green light these things and approve these things. 
and we don't really have that. We're getting, there's some measure of that. Most, most uh, funders now use indigenous-led juries for their indigenous earmarked funds, but you know, there aren't indigenous executives necessarily in any of those uh, companies. And so, um, and of course, you know, the importance of, of narrative sovereignty for nations is very self-evident for First Nations and, and uh, Inuit and Métis, of course, because we've had ours taken. So we, we very much understand what that means. And I think actually bro the broader community has a pretty good understanding of it too, especially in a place like Canada where so much of our media is government funded. Um, you know, we have huge institutions that have been set up for decades who get billions of dollars to make Canadian content, and that is an exercise in narrative sovereignty for Canada. And so we actually are very familiar with how we do this. We actually have parallel systems, largely for French and English, to do this. Um, we, but it's not surprising that a colonial state um, wouldn't necessarily recognize indigenous nations should have their own narrative sovereignty because they don't really want to even recognize us as nations. But we're now making that argument, and uh, I think it's, you know, as I just spelled out to you, it's actually a fairly easy argument to make because uh, I don't think a Canadian bureaucrat or anyone can stand in here and say they don't practice narrative sovereignty for Canada all the time. It's, it's many people's jobs to do that. So we're not asking for that much more, except, you know, entire remake of how the system works. And, <laughs> but, you know, what I would always say is like, the, the, we shouldn't be too that frightened of that. I and mean, it's daunting for those in these positions to, to hear about that. But like these systems also didn't exist for like a long time either. Like, it's not like these are some, this is not a forest we're trying to unmake, because that's really, it's easy to cut it down, but the idea of the forest or a mountain. Um, structures, we often talk about shifting mountains. They're not mountains. Mountains are our grandfathers and our grandmothers. They're sacred beings that are immo immovable. Uh, telefilm or funding structures, they're very movable. Very movable. <laughs> and, um, we, we should move. I think it's actually incredibly important. What's interesting is I think in, is narrative sovereignty for indigenous people will actually benefit narrative sovereignty for Canada. They're not conflicting ideals. They're actually de incredibly dependent on one another. And if Canada actually truly wanted to assert, assert its narrative sovereignty globally, it would be by granting narrative sovereignty for the nations that existed on this land long before it ever did. And then it might actually realize yeah. itself. Well said, yes. Mm. Well, at Hot Docs, in terms of, um, you know, uh, accessibility and gatekeeping, we try to make ourselves as accessible as possible and really trying to lower those barriers of entry. And that includes things like, you know, applying in English or in French. If you prefer to do your application in a video because it's easiest for you to communicate those ideas in that verbal way, we will also accept that we're really open to um, how you want to tell your story. And for our Cross Currents Fund, the global one that we have, when we say that um, you know, we're looking for stories told by filmmakers from with, directly from within the historically underrepresented community, we don't define what that means. We want you to tell us that because we are not the experts. Um, and we, we are re we're really open to hearing that, and it's reflected by our reading and selection committee members. We do consultations with key um, members of the key priority groups. We do a lot of um, engagement in, you know, consulting with individual organizations and um, looking at best practices and really trying to make ourselves uh, really accessible to the filmmakers. And, you know, it, it, we, we've done a lot of these consultations. We go in there, we, we listen, we ask questions, we listen some more, and we respond to what we think um, 
how filmmakers would like to be, uh, how they would like to access the funds because um, we just, we want, we want to be there for um, everyone, obviously we can't, but um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say exactly, but we want to, we want to be accessible. I think you have practiced and you, you kind of adhere to at Hot Docs a certain mode of um, transparency about your processes, you know, and also, and, and probably you too, Jesse, in terms of what you're trying to um, do to help engage the community. And it's just something that's really important as um, transparency becomes less and less. I'm just thinking now in my own country about the lack of transparency or the, you know, emperor has no clothes thing. It's like, he's naked. No, he's not. Yeah. It's a Sharpie thing. But any, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, without the lack of transparency, but to, to do that, we have to kind of really urge and exhort that the, the people making these decisions and their processes be as transparent. So how do you make that um, kind of leap? When I worked in public media, it was really important to be transparent. You know, you have very, your public panel selection process and, you know, you disclose all your numbers. And now things are kind of done by secret cabal or, you know, if you're in a certain group, it's, it's okay. Um, we find, we we're talking about the when the 99 percent all the time. The one percent is the person who gets the big, you know, Netflix deal, and it could be an amazing film like Knock Down the House, or it could be something um, just wonderful. But it is still the one percent. It's not the 99 percent of people from all communities that get that funding support, who get the big holy grail. So how can we be pr transparent in these processes, or really, you know, really kind of um, you know, step on the neck of the industry to say you have to disclose what your, how your decision making is and your practices are. Um, I think it's going to get more complicated next year too when it's like things might get more transparent. But we have to soldier on. <laughs> we have to keep going. Um, do, you have, do you have any more things to add before I open up to questions or do you want to? I have uh, a question for you, that, Jesse. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, what do you uh, what do you hope the industry looks like in five years, and how do we get in there? Five years. Let's say five years. Uh, five years probably good enough for incremental change to occur. Uh, I I don't I try not to. Five years is too short. I you know it's one of the it's one of the reasons why the world's burning is corporations look five year business plans instead of <laughs> you know lifetime business plans. Um, my ultimate goal is that in, that indigenous presence in the industry is not extraordinary. It's normal. Mm -hmm. That Canadians turn on a TV and to see an indigenous person is not newsworthy any longer. Say, reading the news or, say, you know, reading the news, announcing a hockey game, um, uh, being the host of a show, that they are the cast, they're also the crew of a, a given, that that's just normal. We're still, I love celebrating successes, um, but there's a moment where I'd, I'd like to get to the place where it's not as much a celebration, because we're, you know, the old story about football players, don't dance in the end zone, act like you've already been there. I can't wait for my community to be able to act like we've already been there, because we have been there, and it's not so extraordinary. You know, I've had the privilege of being the first indigenous to do a whole bunch of stuff, person to do a whole bunch of stuff. It's pretty lonely when you're first. It's actually not that much fun. And, and my interest isn't, isn't actually in the first. My interest is in the thousandth, the 10,000th, the whatever. Like that's, that's, the, that's the real goal. I don't, five years is, I don't want that much pressure. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I do I think in the, in the five years, we can set, I'm not gonna say the wheel, we can push the canoe into the water so that it's in a little bit. Yes, we can do that in the next five years. I think, in fact, we will do that in the next five years. There will be transformative change in this industry in Canada 
the, 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 part, the building blocks for that will be laid in the next five years. Okay. A very big, great goal. Okay, let's open it to questions. Yes, you, sir, in the second row. You have a question. Could you, could you wait for the mic, just because I think we're recording this. It'd be great to hear you. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was inspiring to listen to uh, the three of you. Uh, my question is about the gatekeeping. And uh, as we have observed, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, basically there are like 10 people in the festival circuit that makes all the decisions, mostly men, mostly white, mostly Christian. Uh, and there are like 20 people under them that make all the selections. And uh, the appointment of these people are never a democratic process that comes from either the filmmakers community or the audience. It's usually a political decision uh, from top to, to bottom. And that's the same case uh, almost here in Canada as well. And uh, usually these are not uh, the five years, these are the lifetime. Like, look at the uh, head of Cannes Film Festival. You know, even when the guy retires, he still has an office there. So, uh, <laughs> and nobody questions that. Uh, do you see that changing here? That, for example, the, first of all, these terms are shorter, and uh, the audience and the filmmaker community have a saying who, of who gonna be the head of TIFF, for example? Who gonna be the programmers of TIFF, or who gonna be you know, the, program, uh, the, the funding organizers and the administrations. Thank you. Well, I, I can only speak on, you know, for hot dogs and what we do, and we really try to uh, make the selection process really as open and tr as transparent as possible, and um, that includes making sure that all the readers and all the selection committee members are peers or they're experienced members of the community that the fund is trying to represent. And we switch that out every single time. It's not the same people. We wanna make sure that um, the people from that, from the communities um, where we've identified or as priority or just filmmakers that have made films from um, within underrepresented communities are there to have a voice as well in, in that aspect. Well, my question is about who decides you get the job? Not who, yeah. how you decide who is appointed. I'm saying the head of the festival. The yes. Key players. Not the it's, uh, Yeah. That yeah. No, I, I, I think... I think it's changing, but it's going to take a long, a long way. You know, there's, a, there's been a shift in the festival structure at Sundance, where the head of programming now is Kim Yutani. Um, there's a new director, artistic director at Locarno. I think for the very, you know, for the for the con and for the other festivals, it might be because, as you say, they are they are kind of like political appointments and for very long periods of time. But there is there's a lot of shifting. One good thing is that there are lots of festivals and they're gaining in their. Um, visibility, so it's not going to be dominated by these um, kind of old guard, either European or, or, or festivals, and there are a lot of um, younger women and people of color that are heading those festivals. It's very, very slow, but I, I believe it's going to happen. Second, another question. Hi. I don't know if this is on. Yes, it's on oh. now. Hi. Okay. Wait, Where are back you? Here. Right here. My name's Heather Great. Marshall, and I've been a doc filmmaker for a long time, and I benefited personally from Studio D at the Film Board. Uh, the last couple of films uh, docs made there were projects that I worked on in, early in my career. So I can attest to the importance of having some home, some safe space to be able to do that kind of work, which was revolutionary then and is not now. My question is actually to Jesse, and when you're speaking of the Pathways document, it brings to mind for me as a practical aspect, the business side of filmmaking, what needs to change then about underlying rights and permissions mm. from the storytellers? And what needs to change uh, when we go in interim finance or put together the, the uh, in quotes, copyright and underlying rights? Could you speak a little bit about mm. that, please? 
involved? Yeah, th it's a great question, and it, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you a totally satisfactory answer. I mean, I, th you know, in the long term, I think there needs to be a rethink on our side in terms of what that contractual language actually looks like. Because the, the idea of, for, for some stories, not all, like I'm really speaking to traditional or what might be culturally specific stories. You know, if an indigenous filmmaker wants to go tell Star Wars, that's a different matter, right? Um, but like the idea of like in rights in perpetuity to like the story of the Wendigo, like that's laughable. Like it's, that's not even a thing. I don't think, like, I, like you would, I don't even know how that would work, to be honest. So I think there needs to be a rethink. I think it would be great to see um, some of the licensing change so the rights revert. Like there's some interesting models, again, in, in Australia and New Zealand, actually around documentaries specifically, where, for example, the rights revert to the community. Mm -hmm. And so the community actually owns the, the film and the community actually becomes a license holder in that you actually have to get their permission to even show the film. So they become a, a, a de facto distributor um, for that. I would like to see some of those ideas. We need to think through that. It's a, it's a challenge given the current rights climate and the desire for you know, uh, networks and, and um, over the top and all these different players to buy like every single piece of right that they can. But I think in, when it comes to certain indigenous stories, I'm not even sure they're clear of what they are buying when they do that, because I'm not sure they actually own anything in those cases. So I think there needs to be a rethink. Luckily in Canada, we have, a, we have some different processes underway with the Broadcast Act. The IP side is also intellectual property side, where there really isn't any reference to traditional knowledge or stories for indigenous peoples and how that would, could be protected um, going forward, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I don't have all of those answers for you, but we are, we are very aware of the issue, and it's something where, to me, it's maybe a little bit down the road, like let's, there's some stuff that has to happen maybe a little earlier while we think about restructuring some of those uh, deals um, so that there's a little better understanding of licensing, and on a totally different side, I'm actually very eager to look at funding license acquisition for indigenous producers of stories from their communities. So, you know, one thing that, that Canada is currently benefiting from is that some other creative industries, namely the literature com community and the music uh, community and visual art, have invested a little bit earlier into indigenous artists. And voila, you know, um, indigenous books are like number one in Canada and have been for a while now. Um, but shocker, when indigenous production companies come to want to license those books for adaptation, oops, we can no longer afford them because well-moneyed legacy producers can. And instead of asking authors to take a discount on selling their license, I would actually rather fund indigenous producers better to acquire that proven property so that we can get more big successes from best-selling indigenous books actually made by indigenous people on screens. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. We're at the end, but I want um, I want you to join me in thanking our panelists, Heidi Tao Yang and Jesse Wente for this panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Jesse, Heidi, and Claire, for those insights. We have a 30-minute break now. We will need to ask you to clear the room, and we'll be back here right at 3.30 with a conversation about some of the complexities of doc curation. Thank you.